Let's talk about some of the end of life issues um, and what the church teaches about ordinary means and extraordinary means. Ordinary means um, are always necessary. Always necessary. You always have to do what's ordinarily um, an ordinary means of sustaining human life because no one lives without these things. Extraordinary means, um, like keeping someone on life support or food and high, um, uh, or in some, ca some cases, food and hydration. We're going to look at, uh, I think it's important for us to know when is extraordinary means necessary, and it truly actually becomes ordinary in that case, uh, or whether it's ex extraordinary and burdensome and not morally necessary. So I'm going to take, some of, I'm going to take all these slides from Deacon John Volk's talk. He gave a talk here um, a couple months ago on this end of life issues, and he gave me his PowerPoint, so I'm just copy and pasted <laughs> because it was good talk. So and you can go on our website and watch the talk. Although I'm gonna summarize. So ordinary versus extraordinary means. So the ERD, the Ethical Religious Directive for Healthcare s s Services, a person has an obligation to use ordinary or proportionate means of preserving his or her life. A person may forego extraordinary or disproportionate means of preserving life. We're not always required to do everything that's humanly possible in order to preserve our lives. We are required to do what's ordinary and proportionate. So let's talk about what that is. Proportionate means are those that in the judgment of the patient offer a reasonable hope of benefit and do not entail an excessive burden or impose excessive expense on the family or the community. And I think it's a couple of important lines here. Uh, in the judgment of the patient, patient, the patient himself has, has the responsibility of judging. Remember, a conscience is a judgment of reason. Um, we live in, now we're with this whole realm of the healthcare system changing. Um, there's always this talk about, is that, are those decisions then going to be made by some board determining what end of life care you receive? And that's immoral. No, it's the patient that should be deciding these things, not some board that says, well, we don't think that you deserve to live anymore. This is burden. That we determine that this is burdensome, so we're not going to pay for this. Now, it's the patient that should be determining what care they receive. Um, and so, this whole benefit and burden. Um, so, benefit. What does it mean? But the, something that is proportionate, ordinary, or shows a benefit to the person. Something that has a, a chance for actually curing a person. So let's say, oh, no, even an easy, an easy example to understand. Person has their 100th year, birthday, turned 100 years old, and they get ill, and um, they're dying. They're dying of pan pancreatic cancer, 100 years old. And, and so the doctor has, oh, we have this new experimental surgery that we can, it's going to take seven hours of surgery and, two, and uh, six months of, of recovery time, and you might extend your life by five days. Okay, obviously they're a hundred. Their body's falling apart. They're dying. That would be, um, there's no chance of, they're a hundred years old. The, ch the probability of that actually curing them is extraordinarily small. Uh, they're most likely going to die on the operating table. Uh, versus someone who, let's say, someone's going into surgery to have their appendix out. Uh, and something happens and they have to be on a respirator for, for 10 days uh, because there was some type of reaction to the medication. They're going to recover as soon as the medication gets out of their system, but for 10 days they have to be on the, um, on the um, life support. Now is, that, is, that, is there a real chance for cure there? Of course there is. It would be immoral in that case for the parents to go in and say, oh, they're on life support, pull the plug, they're going to die. No, they have a real chance for being a cure. It's just a temporary thing versus a 100-year-old woman who goes into a coma, is, is all their internal organs are failing, is only being kept alive on life support, is it required by mandatory to keep, that, keep him on life support? Of course not. They have lost the ability to sustain their own life. There's no chance of a cure, or there's very little hope for, for a cure, um, and it is burdensome at that point. So they could keep the person on life support for an extended period of time if they wish, but it is definitely not morally necessary. Um, is there a chance for improvement of symptoms? Um, is there recovery of function? Prolongation of life? Oops. All these things help us determine, is, help the person determine, is this, 
is this treatment going to be a benefit to me or a burden to me? Uh, what is burdensome then? Is it experimental or risky? Painful or undesirable side effects? Um, interfere with activities and experiences one desires in the time remaining. You'll hear this a lot with doctors. We could, you see this with a lot with um, people at the end of their lives. Well, they're dying of, of you know, some, some serious illness. There's really no possibility of a cure, but do you want to start the radiation and be in the hospital for the last six months of your life or the last three months of your life? Or you say, okay, I'm dying. I have a, there's a 5% chance that this is going to cure me. I'd rather spend the last three months with my family. Um, and so, um, is it, is it going to interfere if, the, if there's little chance, very little chance of, of healing, and it's going to interfere with them actually living out the values of their life? Is there a, a moral objection, psychological repugnance, um, severe demands upon others or cost? Again, all of these things have to be taken together. You can't just pick one of them. You can't say, well, Okay, I've got I, my appendix are about to burst. I'm a 30 year old person, and just the thought of 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 someone else um, cutting me open and taking a part of me is just psychologically repugnant. So I'm just going to let my appendix burst and die. No, <laughs> that's that type of psychological repugnance needs conversion, because there's a there's a real chance it's not experimental or risky. There's a real chance of cure, and the right the the need the the value of our lives um, is, should trump that psychological repugnance. Um, okay. So, um, looking at now one of the issues we find a lot in our society and it's going to become more and more of an issue is this whole issue of, of hydration and nutrition. Um, I'll be honest, there are many times when I go to anoint someone who's dying and I wonder, are they being starved to death? Uh, they've, they're unconscious. They don't have a feeding tube in, um, and I think, how long are, and then you say, well, they went on, they, they're unconscious, they've been unconscious for a few days. When, when, when the nurse says, they've been unconscious for three days, they'll probably die in a couple days. Yeah, I think from starvation. No one lives more than five days without food and, not, and, and water. It ain't gonna happen. Um, everybody dies at that point. You don't, you don't have... So what is the person doing to, how is, the nu how is nutrition going to happen? I think it's very important for us as Catholics to know how to protect ourselves from being um, um, terminally sedated. Uh, terminal sedation is a real, I think, temptation in our culture now, where they just morphine you out of consciousness, you're unconscious, and then you just die that way. And the church actually teaches that if we can, we should die while we're awake. Um, we should meet the Lord awake. Uh, if, we, if we die in our sleep, okay. But sometimes people have this notion that all I want to do is die in my sleep. I personally do not. I want to be awake. I want my last words right before I die to be like, I love you, Jesus. Not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, want to, I want to meet the Lord awake. Um, so, so the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith said this, the administration of food and water, even by artificial means, is in principle ordinary and proportionate mean an ordinary and proportionate means of preserving life. It is therefore obligatory to the extent which, as for long as and for as long as it is shown to accomplish its proper finality, which is hydration and nourishment of the patient. This is a really awesome definition. As long as nutrition and hydration can nutrate and hydrate you, you need to be able to do it. No one lives without nutrition and hydration. No one lives without food and water. So as long as your body can process food and water, you have an obligation to provide those things to a person. You can't just put them on morphine until they're unconscious and let them starve to death or die of de dehydration. Um, and now, but if a person's internal organs are failing, they no longer have the ability to process food or water, but then it's not morally necessary. Everyone's body, when they die, starts to shut down. And if you try to put food um, in the belly of someone who is 99 years old, who is 24 hours from death, you can, you're going to make their stomach blow up. I mean, there, there is, nothing's going to go anywhere um, because their, their internal organ has shut down. Um, but at what level is someone in the nursing home 
who is unconscious and on morphine, um, that's always the question that I think families need to ask. Because I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know how often it happens. Hopefully, not very often. Hopefully, some groups that are caring for people um, are keeping that in mind. But I, I think with the way our culture is going and the disrespect of life, the burden that people, they think of, well, this is just a burden. People are just a burden, so let's abort them. People are just a burden, so let's, let's just let nature take its course so they don't feel any pain. Um, and so they, they, they morphine them out of consciousness. And um, that's not caring for souls. Yes, we need to deal with pain and pain management, but um, it's not merciful to to just take them out of consciousness. Then they're not able to they're not able to consciously pray. They're not be able to be conscious during the sacraments. They're not able to be conscious while their family is loving them. Sometimes they have to. Sometimes they're unconscious because they're in a coma, and the soul can still receive love. But that's not um, that's not the solution. So, um, and this is where then the, the ERD says, medically assisted nutrition and hydration become morally optional when they cannot reasonably be expected to prolong life or when they'd be excessively burdensome for the patient or would cause significant physical discomfort. Uh, for instance, as patients draw close to inevitable death from an underlying progressive and fatal condition, certain measures to provide nutrition and hydration may become excessively burdensome and therefore not obligatory in the light of their very limited ability to prolong life or provide comfort. Uh, again, I use that example of have, putting a feeding tube in a hundred year old person who's a hour, hours from death isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to help them, it's going to hurt them. Um, so that's what we always have to look at. At what level can they receive nutrition and hydration? At what level can their body process nutrition and hydration? That's the level that we have to, are morally obligated to provide it. Just because a person can't swallow anymore does not mean that we're not obligated to provide that. That We have the means now. Um, uh, just because a person's unconscious does not mean that we don't have to provide those things. Just because a person says that they don't feel like eating um, doesn't mean that we, we don't need to find a way to provide those means. If their body has the ability to process food, it needs to. I, I mean, I've been called to the nursing home and say, Father, we need you to come anoint this person, they're dying. And, and I go and I talk to the person, I talk to the nurse, talk to the person, well, why are they dying? They just don't feel like eating anymore. They've just given up. That's called suicide. That's not called dying, that's called suicide. Um, and I won't annoy, I'm not going to annoy a person, I'm hear, not going to hear their confession if they're going to continue with that death wish. I'm not going to assist them thinking that somehow they can continue doing that uh, and that, that somehow I'm going to exonerate their suicide as they commit suicide it's no and i'll say i'm sorry you have to change your mind you have to start eating again but i don't feel like it why is it because they've despaired is it because they feel abandoned in a nursing home because no one in their family comes and meets them i, I remember very distinctly um visiting a person in the nursing home um their spouse is right there with them but they don't even talk so she'd given up on hope she'd given up on life she didn't want to eat anymore she wanted a drink. She was refusing any type of treatment. Uh, and, I, and I look at the situation, I'm like, well, yeah. She's utterly miserable and depressed. She's sitting in this nursing home. No one's visiting her. Her husband's right next to her. All she, but all her husband does is watch TV. He won't even talk to her. They're right in the room next to each other. That's horribly painful. So she's given up on life. But the solution isn't to, to just say, well, I guess there's nothing we can do. The solution is to minister to her, to preach the gospel to her to convert her husband who's sitting right there to rally around her and give her hope so she sees the value of living on earth um, uh, oh, so I think this is the great this is the great other side the whole abortion realm is a great tragedy but the whole other side of the realm is we're not treating we're not caring for those who are elderly we shove them in a nursing home and visit them once a month or visit them on holidays that's not enough. Um, families have an obligation to, to make sure that their family members are experiencing love. Um, so, uh, any questions about the whole realm of artificial hydration nutrition? Yeah. For the sake of the video, I'll repeat what you're saying. So, someone who signs a DNR, 
is that going to be morally acceptable or not to participate in that as, as either the family member or as a, a, a nurse or physician? Right. It depends. It depends on the situation. Is 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 it proportionate means? Uh, if someone signs a DNR and there's a reasonable chance of curing them, um, like I'm, I have my you know getting my appendix out, but I sign a DNR because I'm just kind of hoping I'll die, I have a death wish. No, it's, then it's not morally permissible for the family to participate in that because it's, it's ordinary mean. It would be ordinary. There's a reasonable chance of, of cure. Um, this can be a tr it's a treatment, uh, and the person is going to get better. Someone who is, um, uh, someone who is terminally ill um, and signs a DNR, that's fine. that would actually be morally acceptable because it's extraordinary means. They're terminally ill, they are going to die. They just wish that their life is not um, sustained artificially by a respirator, that they, um, and that's okay. Just like it is okay if someone is um, at the end of their life and the, the, or the person gets in a horrible car accident, you know, they're, um, you know, I get called to the hospital on this. I mean, they're, they're, they're gone. They're, they're, um, they're only being held alive by that respirator. Um, as soon as that respirator is taken off, they're going to die um, because they don't, their body is so damaged they don't have the ability to sustain life. It's not necessary to keep them on a respirator. You can morally withdraw life support and allow, um, allow death to happen. Um, same with someone who's signing a DNR who's terminally ill. Uh, that would be morally acceptable. Again, the principle is um, is there a reasonable chance for a cure or a reasonable chance for getting better? Is the body uh, able, to, able to be healed and sustain its life? Um, and, is, and then it becomes proportionate, ordinary means. If it's not, and there's an excessive burden there, uh, then it can be um, disproportionate and, and extraordinary, not necessary. Okay? Um, uh, now, what about issues where the person is in a uh, in a coma or in a, um, like the whole issue with Terry Schiavo, where people, this is the whole issue that was in the news many years ago, where um, she was not brain dead. She, was, she did not need to be on a respirator. She had a feeding tube in because she couldn't feed herself. She could respond to some stimulus. She wasn't even in a, a totally permanent and vegetative state. And so that was the whole issue, and they ended up removing new, uh, the feeding tube, and she starved to death. Well, it's mortally sinful. Um, it was murder because um, she, any, no one lives without food and water. And as long as her body can, per, can um, process that food and hydration, which it could, it's morally required to give it. It doesn't matter if someone's in a coma or if someone is um, in a, um, some, type of, some type of permanent vegetative state, and it's always a spectrum. If their body has the ability to process food, food needs to be provided. Starvation cannot be the cause of death. Should never be the cause of death or dehydration. Um, so, what about the realms of? Um, how are we doing on time? Uh, what about the realms of of morphine? And I, what I mentioned, this whole real scary thought of of terminal uh, sedation. Well, so looking at any type of um, uh, pain meds, pain, a lot of pain meds will shorten per a person's life. So this is where it's important to know the principle of double effect. Um, and the principle of double effect will be really important to know about when we talk next week about some more specific issues like uh, ectopic pregnancies or uterine ablation or um, uh, the principle of double effect doesn't apply there. Um, or just some of the other um, treating, some of the other types of, of issues in our world. So principle of double effect says that you have um, that there's something that you're going to do that is an intended good effect as well as an unintended bad effect, an un unintended foreseen evil effect. So first, the action you're doing itself must be good or morally indifferent. The good effect cannot be attained through the bad effect. You can't do something evil in order to accomplish something good. That's not the principle of double effect. And there must be a proportionate um, proportionate, uh, be, there must be a proportion between the good and bad effects. The good effect must outweigh the bad effect. Um, and the intention, you can never intend the evil. 
the intention must always be the good and the evil effect only has to be tolerated. Um, so thinking of a Uh, so let's uh, I'll use um, uh, I'll try to I mean let's think of a, a non bioethical situation where you might um, have some type of principal double effect so let's say um, you're driving down the road and um, you see a, a horrible car accident and you're driving it, I'll, I'll make it, okay, streamic situation, okay. So you're driving a tow truck, you see a bus that's about to fall off the cliff with 100 kids in the bus, and you know that if you stop, you're gonna lose your job, or you're not gonna be able to pay your bills, you could be homeless, um, and uh, there's just bad stuff's gonna happen. So is it morally acceptable to drive off? No, it's not. The, the dignity of human life requires that, the, the human life requires that you trust God and do something, be a sin of omission. How do you justify then, like the principle of double effect, so something you're doing is good, you're doing something good, uh, save, trying to save human life, there is an unintended bad effect. You're going to lose your job, the, your boss threatened you, said you're going to lose your job, mortgages due, all these things. You're, not in, you're tolerating that bad effect. Um, uh, you're not, the saving lives doesn't come about through losing, through um, not being able to provide for your family. Although losing your job is not an evil effect, it's a, someone, it's just a consequence. Um, and there's a, obviously a good proportion reason there. You're saving human lives, even if it means uh, threatening your own. Um, the intention must be good and the uh, uh, evil effect only, is only being tolerated. Another example would be jumping on a landmine. You know, or jumping on a grenade. Uh, obviously, the value of human life means that you should try to preserve your life. But if someone throws a grenade and you see someone jumping on it, what's the what's the good good effect? The good effect is to save human life. The unintended bad effect is that you get blown to bullet bits, tragically enough, um, and you're not um, you're not killing. You're not, um, uh, and so there is a, a, a justification there. So, and there's no other means available. Okay, so uh, this is the whole realm of that terminal sedation. So Pope Pius XII said, it is licit to relieve pain by narcotics, even when the result is decreased consciousness and a shortening of life, if this does not prevent the carrying out of other religious and moral duties. It is not right to deprive the dying person of consciousness without a serious moral reason. Serious moral reason. And then Pope John Paul in Evangelium Vitae, as they approach death, people ought to prepare in a fully conscious way for their definitive meeting with God. So, you know, someone is, is terminally ill and they're experiencing a massive amount of pain, and then the doctor knows that giving them morphine is going, it could very well shorten their life, is morally permissible under the principle of double effect because um, the, what they're doing is something good. They're intending to alleviate pain um, they know that there's an unintended bad effect where their life is going to be shortened a certain amount, um, but uh, and they're not and they're not intending that bad effect. They're not saying, well, let's just let's just off them quickly by morphing them up. No, they're intending to alleviate the pain. So it's morally permissible if there's a proportionate reasons, but it doesn't make it morally permissible, obviously, to go to the extreme and just terminally sedate them, make them unconscious, and let them starve to death. Uh, that's not not an acceptable thing. And I think people, dot people in the healthcare system need to be aware um, that being unconscious is not the ideal. Um, but is there a way to, ha to manage the pain while still being conscious and prepare to meet the Lord? Um, I mean, can you imagine what, I mean, I, the vast, I mean, the vast majority of my anointings that I go, go to the hospital with, I'd say the majority of them are people who have been away for... Uh, decades from the church or years and years from the church are un unconscious and so I'm giving the anointing of the sick to someone who has been away from God is not conscious, not aware of what's going on that's not uh, we believe that the sacraments are powerful 
if they're not resisting the grace, they're not rejecting it, they're open to the grace, the grace is going to be operative, it can bring the forgiveness of sins and restore them to God. But how much could they actually have prepared if they hadn't been made unconscious by the morphine? Maybe they would. Maybe their entire time in purgatory would be undone if they were able to prepare, convert, um, rather than just, well, let's, let's, let's wait until they're unconscious and then we'll call the priest. I had, I had that happen once where it was so weird. So, um, and I ended up anointing the person because I couldn't tell what the family was saying. I mean, ho hopefully I didn't misinterpret things. Because when I went to go anoint someone, this is years ago, not at this parish, and I get there, it's three in the morning, or two or three in the morning, and the guy had been there days and days, and they waited till two in the morning to call the priest. Please don't do that. Don't be in the hospital a week and wait till two in the morning to call me. I mean, come on. Call me at like six in the afternoon, or two o'clock in the afternoon, not two in the morning. So what is that? Anyway, so that's what they did. Um, and because uh, people often think, they have this mentality that when well, you call the priest, right as they're about to die. Well, what if I can't get there in the next 20 minutes? No, well, as soon as you think that you're going down that path, call the priest because sometimes the priest is busy. Like, if I had to get a call right now, I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't be there for a few more minutes. Um, oh, so, so I get the call and I get there and I have half the family saying, Father, to be honest with you, before he went into the hospital, he told us never to call the priest. He didn't want to be anointed. He didn't want any of these things. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm going home. Um, and then the wife was saying, no, he needs this, he needs this, he needs this. Um, and can't we just, as he was still conscious, and, and so it basically went in and told the nurse, can you just knock him out? <laughs> Thinking that, oh, I'll just knock him out so the priest can come in and do the sacraments. And then it's like, wait a second. We're not, this is not, this is, this is not good. I mean, the person... If the person, while they're conscious, is saying, no, 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 you don't just make them unconscious so that the priest can come in and, you know, it's like, that's pretty tricky, you know. Um, now, thankfully, the, I mean, the, the wife was saying that he didn't express some, some rejection. I mean, sometimes there's a huge difference between rejecting the faith and just being afraid of death. One is saying, don't call the priest because I don't want to die because I'm afraid of dying. I just want to, I don't want to accept the reality that I'm dying. The other is, don't call the priest because I don't care about God. I don't care about the church. I don't care about any of these things. Um, and so, obviously, a fear of death is, um, uh, wouldn't be a, a reason to deny someone the sacrament or rejection of the faith would be a reason to deny someone, of course. Um, all right. So, um, but I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing when I go to a hospital and I see the family gathered there and I see the person awake and I'm just able to talk to them. And it's so, uh, what's that word? Um, taboo, so taboo, um, but I do it anyway, is to go up and to, to sit down with them and say, so you're dying. And they go, oh, no, oh, it's so taboo, you don't talk about it. They know they're dying. Like. I, was, I say to him, so you think God's calling you home, huh? Calling you, calling you back to heaven, you're going to die? You know? I, mean, I won't say it like that, of course. <laughs> you're dying, huh? No, I don't say it like that. Um, but just to, to be honest with them, I mean, it's, they know what's going on. Um, and not talking about it isn't helpful to them. They need to say their goodbyes. They need to uh, forgive what needs to be forgiven, apologize for what needs to be apologized for, and just be able to say, um, you know, death is not the end all be all of existence. We don't cease to exist when we die. In fact, it's going to be winning the race for a Christian when, when, when our final day comes. That should be a day of, of excitement. You're like, we'll see Jesus. Uh, and I remember one of my friends, when she died at 18, um, she had said, uh, uh, she said, you know, I don't know, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I at least get to see Jesus. <laughs> of course, I knew where she was going. I mean, she was going to heaven. She was a holy person. Um, but she, there was, and so to be able to talk about that, to be able to talk about what it's going to be like in heaven, um, you shouldn't be afraid of that thing. That can give them hope. Uh, whereas oftentimes when people are, are dying, sometimes they feel guilty, like they're letting everyone down. And they, they hold on because they feel like they're guilty. Like, please don't go, please don't go, please don't go. 
that's putting all that burden on them, um, saying versus, all right, it's your, it's your time. God's calling you home. It's going to be a painful thing to lose you, but they're not lost. If we're in Christ, um, death cannot separate us from the ones we love. If we're in Christ, if someone's with God in heaven, we're still connected to them through the communion of saints. Uh, that's a beautiful thing. And so to be able to talk about it with a family member that's, that's dying and talk about heaven, to, um, to really help prepare them, it can be a powerful thing. And to, to spend those last hours praying and loving God and preparing the soul can be so powerful. Um, you know, it's, that's a good way to go right there is, is to go, go with the, the name of Jesus on your lips, um, to go with the name of Jesus in your heart.